Okay, here we go. Well, a lot of you have been working for with the Course of Miracles for some time, and we you know how how deep the forgiveness work is. And I think this 35-minute mini movie. Like a composite mini movie. Again, a Star Trek episode that's been edited down this time for teaching purposes to just 35 minutes, but it is packed full of opportunities to really zoom into your mind and go for forgiveness in a very deep way, which is really what we want. We want to go into our minds to find the forgiveness that Jesus is teaching us. So this movie will, will have a lot to do with memory. Uh, also I had a request to, uh, I don't know if we'll be able to do it tonight, but certainly tomorrow with the Q&A's to talk a little bit about community, uh, about the symbol of community and how helpful that is. Because I think from being here, just for these days, you can sense there's like a synergy that happens when you're, when you're practicing forgiveness with those that are around you. There's some kind of a helpful synergy that's going on. Like, ooh, well we're all brought together, it's kind of fun. We're kind of vibrating <laughs> at the same frequency a bit and it's bringing up some, some issues to look at in kind of an accelerated way. So. That's really the whole purpose of the community symbol, is to be able to do that in a safe way without kind of feeling like it can just blow up or it can be thrown out <laughs> uh, because of the intense emotions. <coughs> now last night we got, with the thaw, we had an overall picture of, of the ego and its tricks of fear and guilt and anger to keep the mind trapped and asleep. Tonight's little mini-movie is going to have a main character in it that is, uh, his name is Sisko. And uh, he's a commander of his ship, but he is going to be sent on a mission which is really a mission of forgiveness, for his own sense of forgiveness. And this is going to be a very good teaching device for us, because in this episode uh, we can see that he recalls a time when uh, Captain Picard, some of you know Captain John Luke Picard, is taken over by the Borg. Does anybody know anything about Star Trek and the Borg? The Borg assimilate your identity and take you over and kind of make you part machine, part human, part of the collective. I call it the collective unconscious because it's so forced, it's not the, like the collective conscious, it's more like the collective unconscious. But there's a memory where Picard is assimilated into the Borg and then he's part of an attack in which Sisko's wife is killed. So, Sisko has a grievance. He feels like his wife has been murdered and, and that John luc Picard was part of that, uh, being taken over by the Borg. And so he's got a lot of rage that's just right under the surface. And so he's going to be our main character at, at learning to forgive the rage that's underneath a lot of we could say our upsets, our irritations, our annoyances, our fatigue, everything we experience that's upsetting in the human condition has rage underneath it. It's not your personal rage, it's really the ego's rage at God. The ego made up this time-space world as like a fantasy world, as a false identity, and it's waiting for God to grant reality to the fantasy. But God would not be God 
if the God of love gave reality to fantasies. Because spirit is what reality is all about. And so, Sisko is going to have to get in touch with his rage. Now, part of his mission is he's going to be sent to help a, a, a race called the Pejorans. And it seems to him like the Pejorans are kind of a backward, uh, we were talking about indigenous peoples, like a backward simple people. But actually the Pejorans are spiritually advanced. So he thinks he's going in to help them. And really he's being sent to a very advanced people. And he's going to be uh, working with uh, a prophetess who basically can read his mind and read his power, which is kind of his, uh, his destiny in life. And she's there uh, seemingly receiving his help, although uh, she's like saying, huh, it's ironic that the one that sent <coughs> as the emissary is, is in need of the help. <laughs> like, he's being sent as an emissary to help them, but he's the one that needs it because he has so much anger. And a lot of his anger is tied into the loss of his wife. Now loss, rejection and abandonment, those are very key issues for the ego. Mm -hmm. Betrayal, loss, abandonment, rejection. So we're going to deal with the core issues of the ego with this clip tonight, with this little mini-movie. We're going to see that Cisco is taken on a journey to, to heal this unconscious rage that he has. And he's going to show us too about how to come to a present decision. This word decision keeps coming up for us. This idea that, that forgiveness is a decision. It's even a workbook lesson where Jesus says, Heaven is the decision I must make. That in reality, heaven is just a perfect state of both spirit. But, because the mind has fallen asleep and believes in duality, then heaven has to take the form of a decision. The sleeping mind cannot relate to heaven anymore. It's had total amnesia, a complete amnesia. It has no sense of heaven at all. So now heaven has to take the form of a decision. And yet, to human beings, it seems as if there are all these dark and negative memories that we have in our mind. And it's almost as if the human is trying to find a way to get past those dark memories. And typically we think of having positive memories, making new memories, and positive memories to offset the negative. And many humans believe that the goal in life is to make as many positive memories as you can to offset a pretty dark world, a dark and hostile world. Like make the best of it. Make the best memories you can. But actually, the ego is using not only the bad memories, the dark memories to block the light, but it's using the good memories too. It's using both ends of the stick to block the mind from waking up. So that's why we need miracles. We need to have, be shown by some higher power, by something greater than our darkened, sleeping mind, we need to be shown the way back. And we need to be taken inside to start to realize that this moment, this present moment is our power of choice. And that we can literally forgive only in this moment. That our problem isn't linear time, or good memories and bad memories, it's the, it's the total misuse of memories. We're trying to avoid the bad memories and make good memories to take the place, and, and all the memories have to be released in order to reach the state of oneness. So this is going to be a very profound journey. He has a tremendous sense of loss with around his wife. He's, he'll try to make the best of it with his son and go forward, but, but he has this deep sense of loss that is, has to be 
healed in some way. And in this little mini-movie, it's going to be coming in contact with the light. And that's what I talked about earlier when I mentioned this movie. Instead of going to, to the Klingons, the Ramiman, the Borg, something like this, he's going to actually go through a wormhole and come in direct contact with divine light. Now, think of it, how important that would be for all of us. Because if we're just identified with just nothing but good memories and bad memories, and duality, then we don't have a, a, a memory or an experience of the light. And we really don't understand what the final decision is going to be about. Because all we know is this good-bad memory thing. Everything that we look around and see in the world of duality is, is just dualistic symbols. We may talk of eternity and use the word eternity, but there's no symbols in time and space that really reflect eternity. That's why we need so much help. We may, of our love song, I love you forever. I'll love you until the stars go out in the heavens. And you know, we have all these love stories, love songs, but the idea of coming to that eternal nature is going to take a big clearing of our consciousness to, to even come close to that. And that's what I like about this movie. It actually gives us a juxtaposition that love and light is literally it transcends all of the dualistic concepts. So we can't hold on to the negative or the positive memories to know that light. And this, this little mini-movie shows us that in a very clear way. So when you go on this journey with Cisco, you're going to be going on a journey with your own mind. And it's like being shown the keys to forgiveness. And that's the greatest gift that you possibly could have, is to get a glimmer of this true forgiveness. As it's been pushed out of awareness, it's been blocked over, but this is, is a mini-movie that's really going to take you there. So, it's quite exciting to think that it's, we can go on this journey together to the light. Uh, and right before they go through to the light for the first time, uh, Cisco will be traveling uh, with uh, one of his uh, crewmates, who's a woman, and there's a beautiful scene when they first uh, go through this wormhole, where we get to see two divergent perceptions of the world. One is his perception, and one is her perception, and we know how that can go with his and her perception. <laughs> it's really a darling uh, little scene, because her perception of the world is very different than his perception. And yet both perceptions have nothing at all to do with the light. So when the light comes, it's going to come and just transcend uh, the human perception entirely. And then we'll start to see this interaction between us and the light through Cisco's attempts, his memories, his associations. So this is kind of one of those things, hold on to your hat, because Kansas is going bye-bye. We don't get to see many movies that go through to abstraction. We're always off encountering different species. And in this world we're encountering different stories. But this one's going cracking through into divine light. And I think that's a spectacular teaching device. You know, it's, you can just feel the power of starting to get in touch with this divine light that you truly are. Kind of a rare opportunity. Okay, we'll let her roll. really 
encountering uh, Jean-Luc Picard in the moment. It's just, through his filter, he just sees, you, you murdered my wife. And there's a tremendous sense of, of loss. And you might say that's what plagues human beings when they go through difficulties in relationship. It's, it's this deep, dark sense of, of loss. It's a deep grievance that's filtering through into the surface of consciousness. And it seems to have to do with behavior, what somebody said or did or didn't say or didn't do. But what's happening when the upsets come up in relationships is it's this dark grievance that's been buried in the unconscious that's coming up. And that's what Cisco is dealing with. So he's got a rage underneath. And he's wanting to be transferred back to civilian duty. He wants out of of space travel. He's been doing the best that he can, raising his son as a single father, but, but he misses his wife. He's got a tremendous sense of loss that he's dealing with, and, and that's going to be a good learning opportunity to start to see how will the Holy Spirit deal with that deep sense of grief and loss that he has. There has to be a way to start to let him bring those emotions up and start to face those emotions. And that's why even on this retreat, you know, when we're going into these movies, we're having expression sessions, it's just starting to trigger what lies beneath. And that's good. We have to let these dark emotions up. There has to be a context for letting them up. Because if we hide them and we protect them, then it's just going to delay the healing and it will delay the awakening, and it will delay the decision to forgive. We cannot skip over that darkness. So as I said, this mission he's going to be sent on by John Luke Picard there to go help the Bajorans to this planet, it's going to be his salvation. He's going to have to face everything that he's denied from awareness, and we're going to get to, to watch him and go on the journey with him. Okay. So, that's an example of, of the Holy Spirit in action. The, the tear of the prophet just gave him a glimmer of a very happy, loving memory of meeting his wife on that beach. You see how happy he was? Just absolutely exuberant. He couldn't even contain himself in meeting her. And then when the little glimpse ended, this positive memory, he, it was almost like a shattering of coming back to his consciousness, where he had pretty much pushed, pushed that out of awareness is a way of dealing with the loss. Sometimes people try to forget traumatic things and, and you push away the positive and the negative. So that was an example of a, like a prophecy or this psychic use of memory to bring things back into awareness so that you can start to begin to understand that you can't keep avoiding the negative and just trying to engage the positive. You have to actually start to see the sameness of the memories that are blocking the light. And now he's in his spacecraft here and he's going to be going through his, his wormhole experience and coming to the perception of perceptual differences human differences based on selection and then cracking through to the light. But that was just an example of, of the Holy Spirit using memory to bring, bring emotions up to the surface and we saw how effective that was for him, but also how, how shattering it was. It was like almost like a shattering of his consciousness, like a slice back to something that was pushed away. Okay, now we're going to see 
This is a teaching here, first by the light, that no two people see the same world. That's why we have interpersonal conflicts, is because no two people are perceiving exactly the same world. They're just perceiving the world through their egoic filter and giving meaning to it. And then another person is perceiving a completely different world. There may be common elements, but no two people perceive the same world. Ultimately, since there's one mind, there aren't even two people. But, for our purposes here, here we have Dak and Cisco walking out onto this planet, and we have his perception followed by her perception. And that's even gets better here. <laughs> Memory. Because the light is just pure love and abstraction, but, it, but in order to even communicate, with him, and he has to have, has to have some memories, and that's what the Holy Spirit does with all the images and memories that have made up as part of the dream. It can use the symbols and images, but but it, it uses them to, as a teaching device to teach about the light. So it's just probing his his the images, memories of his wife, of his son. We saw a baseball glove there. It's probing his his memories of the the game baseball, which is. Earth time game, and it's just doing that so it can actually communicate with him. So this is getting down to the core teachings that Jesus is teaching us in the Course, that, that in reality there is no past, present, and future. There is no ordering of sequences of events, from past events that have already happened, to future events that have not yet happened. There isn't even a sense of causation, because in the earth plane, or linear time, it seems like the past causes the present, which then causes the future. There seems to be a linear progression in causation. <coughs> when we think about hurts, where hurts started, even, even Freudian uh, psychotherapy was always looking at the Oedipal complex, looking back, what was your relationship to your mother? What was your relationship to your father? You see, looking back for past hurts, past causes, past memories, and as he's trying to convince the light about this linear existence, about loss being real, about the past, you know, being gone, all these concepts that he's trying to convince the light with, the light just is saying it's inconceivable that there could be a species existing like this. This, this violates all the laws of love. All the laws of reality are violated by this past, present, future construct. We've just accepted, we've been hoodwinked, we've been, we've bought a lie, we've bought a belief in time that the ego invented. The ego invented linear time to, to perpetuate guilt. Basically to the ego, you're guilty in the past, the present moment is just this little blip that you can't do anything about. It's ineffectual. It's going to get swept away, swept right over real quick and turn into the future. So, you see how it needs linear time to perpetuate guilt. You're guilty in the past. You can't do anything about it in the present. It will be gone in a, in a blink. And then you're going to be guilty in the future. Guilty, guilty, guilty. And then, the ego goes a step further and says, and don't think that God is going to let you get away with all this guilt. Guilt, according to the ego, demands punishment. And now you see this crazy religious system that we've been following, call it whatever, Calvinism, Catholicism, call it whatever you want. It's, it's the whole thing is made up to perpetuate guilt. God is going to get you in the end. You can't expect God to let you get away with all this guilt without punishing you at some point in the future. And, with some of our, our stark, harshest religions, it's, some of us were raised with the concept of eternal damnation. Oh, oh, oh boy, that's what waits for us, you know? Oh, they, that's, a, that's a future. Eternal damnation, burn in hell, burn in the fire forever, you know. Talk about scaring, scaring people 
and in keeping the mind locked into the guilt with this fear of punishment. So that's what's going on. And, and here he is, Cisco has got this rage underneath, this huge sense of grievance about losing his wife, this sense of anger at Picard, and, and all the light can do is say, it is your existence. Your, your pleasant memories is part of your existence. Your painful memories is part of your existence. The light is just trying to say, why do you keep dividing this dualistic experience up into all these different memories and trying to recall some and avoid others when the past, present, and future are continuous. It's all part of your existence. You have to accept all of it into awareness to heal from it. You have to quit trying to judge the negative from the positive. I have some of you know that song, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, don't mess with Mr. In-Between. You know, the ego is always trying to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative, but it doesn't tell you that they're all the same, that all the memories are part of existence. And that's what the light is just saying, it's your existence. It's your existence. What was and what will be is your existence. Your existence doesn't change. Your existence is a constant. Like love, who you were created by God, is constant. It doesn't change. It's not this and that, or a little bit of this and a little bit of that, or, or something. So it's just an amazing back and forth that's going on because He's trying to convince the light. No, no, no. Light, light, listen. <laughs> light, light. You gotta go wrong. My wife is dead. She's gone. I'll never have her back again. It's terrible. I'll never have the love again. It's gone. And now I'm stuck with this time thing. And I'm just trying to make the best of a bad situation. And the light's like, I don't get it. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's inconceivable that species could exist like that. It makes no sense at all to the light. That's what we need. You see, we need the light to show us how crazy this linear guilt trip has been. But if we're growing up in the linear guilt trip and we don't know any different, then you're invested there and you just keep karmically replaying out the same memories, trying to push certain things away, trying to make the best of it, trying to carve out some good memories, you know. <laughs> Using your iPhone to get to capture as many good memories as you can, because it's a damn hard world, and you've got to carve out a few good ones. You can put in a scrapbook someday, you know, and say, aha, look at that, see I got something good there. You know, it's, the light is just not buying it. The light's like, what are you, what are you talking about? So the light is going to try to reach him and reach consciousness and teach him that everything he believes about time and space is mistaken. And now he's going to have a little replay of a memory where, where he's having a discussion in a beautiful sunny day in the park with his future wife about raising a family and having children and uh, he's going to be like in his higher self with the light looking back reviewing this another very positive memory for him of having a picnic with his future wife and planning the future together and family and, and the light is going to be watching the whole thing <laughs> Like, what the heck is this? <laughs> what are you coming up with now? <laughs> yes. Now, let's watch the, the one that's observing. You know, he's got all this belief in loss in his mind, like he's lost his wife forever. She's dead, she's gone. He's never going to kiss her again. So he's viewing this, and let's watch him viewing this, and his reaction will freeze frame with his face, and then let's watch the light. The light's observing the same situation. There it is. Look at his face. Now there we've got his face, and he
he's got this, you know, the eyes are closing, I'm like, damn, there it is again, I'm never going to have that, I'm never going to have another kiss, ever. And it's like this, ugh. And then there's, on the left, there's the light, watching the scene, like, oh. It's never seen a kiss before. <laughs> it's quite curious about this kiss. It's just like, hmm, interesting. And watch his face. And all that reaction you're seeing on that face is coming from interpretations. Through the filter of loss, like, oh, I will never have that again. It's gone forever. You see, that interpretation is what, that time interpretation is bringing the experience of pain. The light doesn't know what's going on there. Like, <laughs> you see, here we go again. He's, he's really trying to explain to the light that his past, present, future, there are consequences. There are consequences in time that come from certain actions. And he's trying to tell the light the consequence was you. And the light's going, me? <laughs> because he's seeing the past, he's seeing a boy. He's seeing that the, the consequences of sexual activity, the consequences of impregnation, the consequences of, of being pregnant, bringing a child into the world, is, is a little boy. Past, present, future. You know, this is part of what we call Newtonian physics, Isaac Newton. Mm. For every action, there's a reaction. Mm. You see, we've been trained, we've been taking science classes that teach us that there's events in the world that cause other events. Mm. And the light's like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> they're all just, they're all the same. There's not some that cause other things. So it's co completely inconceivable, this linear progression to the light. The light cannot understand this linear progression. And think about it when, when you blame somebody. You did this. You made me angry. You're, it's your fault. If you hadn't done that, we would still be married. If, if you had acted differently, if you had said something different, you know, hypotheticals, if you had done something different, that things would be a lot different. But actually, all of these memories, all of the memories are part of existence. And some things don't cause other things. There is no causation in form. Only the mind is causative. That's what the Course is taking us back to an experience. Only the mind is causative. If you believe in the ego, you can make up false consequences, you can make up false effects, but that's the whole, the whole world. And if you take causation back to the mind, then you are free of this false linear cause and effect thing. You know, somebody could say, well, don't, don't have too many cups of coffee during the evening or during the day, because you won't be able to sleep. Why? Because they say caffeine, too much caffeine causes you not to sleep. That's just one example. Uh, staying out in, on the beach too long and having your skin too long exposed to the sun's radiation. If you stay on a beach for too many hours and unprotected from the ultraviolet rays of the sun, that the sun, the ultraviolet rays, could cause cancer in your body. That's, that's a commonly accepted thing. As if these things in this ball of fire in the sky uh, could cause cancer. Cancer is, is a decision of the mind. It, it's a wrong-minded decision that we talked about. But there's nothing outside the mind, outside of consciousness, is causing anything. If you, if you don't eat enough food and nutrition, then the body could, could starve to death. You could die of, of malnutrition. Even though we have yogis and mystics and saints that go for long periods of time, there are breatharians that, that actually go through without, uh, 
without eating food. Living off the air, off of prana energy. There's nothing causative about food going down and, and chewing and digesting. it. Oh, the whole system of the human body, everything about science, everything we know about medical science and everything, is what's underneath all of it, it's this false linear progression as if there are causes in the world and consequences in the world. There are causes in the body and consequences in the body. People might say, well, if it gets to be too cold, if the environment's too cold, the body, unless it's properly clothed and protected with houses and clothes, it could freeze to death. And then what do we have? We have yogis who go into freeze chambers wearing nothing but a g-string. <laughs> and they, does the cold freeze their bodies? No! They generate the heat. They generate the BTUs. They generate the heat. Because of why? Because it's all consciousness. Everything we know about parapsychology, about consciousness studies, is pointing us to the power of the mind, the power of thought. And, and where all of this is leading is to a different perspective of the world where we start to see the world as simultaneous. We give up all these crazy cause-effect, uh, false cause-effect <laughs> concepts that are in our mind, which just perpetuate guilt, perpetuate fear, perpetuate the fear of punishment. You know, so we're onto it now between science, quantum physics, between breakthroughs in philosophy, between A Course in Miracles, Advaita Vedanta, all the great non-dual teachings on the planet now, we are at a point right now where we can start to really take these in fully and come closer to the place when Jesus said, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I have dominion over the world. I have dominion over the images that the ego made up. Because I have dominion over the ego, like our movie last night, Transcendence. Some of you did see that movie, Transcendence, with Johnny Depp, where he basically, you know, his body seems to die, but his mind, his consciousness gets uploaded to the internet. And his wife says to her beloved husband, where are you? He goes, everywhere. <laughs> what happens to Lucy at the end of the movie, Lucy? Yeah, the same, yeah. Where, where's Lucy? Everywhere. That's where we are. We're not products of time and space locked into some location in time and space. We're everywhere. And we've always been everywhere. The ego doesn't want us to know that. It wants us to keep hanging on to this guilt game, you know? Guilt in the past, guilt in the future, then you die, and then you get punished. That's an old story. So here it is, he's definitely trying to convince the light of the linear progression, and the light is just saying, like he said, you were the consequence <laughs> of my wife and I. You were the consequence. And he's like, me? <laughs> like, you think I'm a body? You think love and light is the consequence of a man and a woman? No. That's part of the linear progression. Aggressive, adversarial, competition, for fun, <laughs> competition, <laughs> you see how upbeat he is, competition, light, come on light, this is fun, competition, <laughs> and the light, the light is not buying it, <laughs> adversarial. There's, there's, there's a conflict. You have, ad you have adversaries, you have opposites, you have a battle going on. We may think, oh, the Olympics are sweet, all these countries competing, oh, how wonderful. <laughs> Every four years we come together to compete and spend millions and millions of dollars yeah. to watch bodies do crazy things. <laughs> and. We dress them up and we get some flags, and we march with some flags, and they can do you know, the rings, and they can do some dances, and they and the athletes what work for hundreds of hours training. Gymnastics, archery, 
tennis, you know, you get the whole thing. And so we spend millions and millions of dollars so we can sit by a TV set and watch competition. <laughs> Adversarial, the light says. Of no use whatsoever. <laughs> Absolutely no use. What a bunch of baloney. <laughs> and we do it every four years. It doesn't say much for earthlings. And so now, we're going to get to see a scene here where he's going to try to convince the light how wonderful baseball is. <laughs> he's going to try to convince spirit how wonderful, because what's so exciting about it is, is you don't know what's going to happen. The pitcher pitches the ball, the batter swings. If that batter makes contact, ooh, it gets even more exciting. You don't know where the ball's going to go. It could be fouled back. It could go here. It could go there. Why do people enjoy gambling? Why do people enjoy gambling? You make your wager. What's the excitement? You don't know what's going to happen. You just may win. You may lose. Probably you'll lose. <laughs> There's a really good chance you're going to lose. But just for the excitement of some chance that you may win, you play the game. See, hypotheticals, ooh, the excitement of not knowing where the ball goes, the excitement of not knowing if you'll win or lose. What's the excitement of going out on the first date? What's the thrill of a first date? You may have a good time. <laughs> you may have a good time. And if what happens if you have a good time? You may have a second date. May. It's all hypothetical. But you may have a second date. And you see how exciting that is to the ego mind. It's got to keep you distracted from eternal life. Dating is a good way to stay distracted from eternal life. Because you just never know. And maybe you get a third day. Maybe you score. Maybe it goes further. Maybe you get engaged. There you go, duality speaking back there. Oh no! <laughs> but the ego is holding it out like a piece of cheese. Like, ooh, maybe it turns out really good. You see, it's hypotheticals. It's all these hypotheticals. And like I was sharing the other night, this whole world, this whole cosmos, is as if the separation happened. So the ego is trying to use all these hypotheticals to make time and space as enticing as it can be. To keep your attention riveted on what might be in the future. It wants you to put lots of time and energy on what might be in the future. Working hard at meaningless jobs, saving money, for what? For the future. <laughs> How much do we need right now? Did anybody ever watch the Barbara Streisand movie, Funny Girl? Yeah. I've got the luck on my door, that's the way to be. They can steal the rug from my floor, that's okay with me. Because the things that I prize, like the stars and the skies, they're all free. Oh, I've got plenty of nothing, and nothing's plenty for me. I got the sun, I got the moon, I got the deep blue sea. Folks with plenty of plenty, they got a lock on their door. Afraid somebody's gonna rob them now that they're making more. What for? See? The great sage. Barbara Streisand, singing in Funny Girl. Now, here we go. If you play by the ego's game, the future is important. And then you're just going to keep using your mind's energy, trying to go after an imaginary future. Imaginary future love. Imaginary future wealth. Better memories in the future. Making more memories in the future. 
And all of it's part of a wheel of trying to keep you distracted from the present moment. So this is a beautiful scene where he's actually going to try very hard to convince the light how wonderful baseball is. <laughs> See if it works. See if the light is buying. Well, I'll you your ignorance of what is to come. Okay, there it is. There's the light's answer to the whole convincing argument about baseball. You value your ignorance of what is to come. You value the excitement of being ignorant, of knowing the outcome. You value the ignorance of what is to come. And he says, pitch after, you see how excited he is? Pitch after pitch, pitch after pitch, he's so excited. You don't know what's going to happen, pitch after pitch. He's like, it's so exciting, right? It's so exciting. And you could extend that second after second. In the earth life, second after second, minute after minute, you don't know what's coming. And the ego is saying, isn't that exciting? We're staying in time and space and being guilty and being punished. Isn't it worth it? See? Enjoy. Enjoy your life on earth, minute by minute, second by second. And the light's like, what are you talking about? This is, the light is eternity. Why would you try to play this game of second by second, minute by minute, if it's all part of a trap to keep you guilty. Mm. If you knew what was happening, would you still play the game? Would you put more focus on meditation? Would you watch your mind even closer for forgiveness? Be more attentive to your state of mind. Be more attentive to your attitudes come more to more retreats like this, or even talk to people, hey, I just attended that retreat, that five-day retreat. I'm through with this linear stuff. I'm not going to invest in uh, linear time. Uh, what about my career? Sorry. I'm not, I'm not through with career. What do you mean you're through with the career? How are you going to get your stuff? You get all your stuff without a career. What's the stuff for? <laughs> what, that's a good question. What is all this stuff for? Why do we need all this stuff? Yeah. Really, you know, can we not be content with the present moment? If you start to see what, what this is all pointing at, then your mind can go through a radical shift of focus. Where you just say, okay Holy Spirit, I see you've got some good ideas going here. <laughs> And you're calling me to serve a plan of undoing linear time in my mind, in the mind, and then this other stuff suddenly, you know, the Olympics suddenly are not so attractive. You know, I mean a lot of things in this world are not attractive. Trying to build a nest egg, save money for the future, you know, trying to make the world a better place in the future you know, becomes less and less important than sinking into the present moment. Mm -hmm. Now we see that people like Ramana Maharshi, maybe they hit it right. Maybe Ramana had something going on there, with those glowing eyes. Maybe silence was important. And stillness, instead of all this productivity. And what have you done lately to contribute to the gross national product of your country? Who cares? Who really cares about the gross national product? Do you care about the gross national product or peace of mind? What's more important, peace of mind or, or productivity? You see, we start to, once we have the light's perspective, we start to go, ooh, now I've got a context for making mm. decisions on what's valuable mm. and what's valueless. It's the encounter with the light that brings all this wisdom flooding into your mind. Okay, now it's gonna, we're going to see how the light is going to start to heal these grievances. Yes? Yeah, um, in, in my thought there was suddenly a comparison, comparison between uh, what he says, uh, every pitch is, uh, is so exciting because I don't know what's going to happen, and releasing my life to the Holy Spirit, because then I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, that's beautiful. 
That's that's the option. Where's the difference? <laughs> well, releasing your life to the Holy Spirit is releasing it to one who knows you as you really are, who's the memory of, of in God's mind. It's like the memory of who you really are. And so the one presence in the mind that really has a good view of the big picture of what could really be truly helpful for you and everyone on the planet is is the spirit in the mind, the light in a darkened mind. And so that's the big difference between releasing it to the Holy Spirit versus trying to use it in some other way. Releasing it to another person or to a government or to a, a group of people or whatever. Uh, because there can still be errors that come in. Like if you give your life over to even a, a group of people and say, you know better, you know, I'll join you and you determine what my life should be. In the end, it's the Spirit inside of us, the, the Holy Spirit that, that knows the way back to eternity. So it's a big difference, really. Okay, now we're going to continue on and we're going to start to, again, the light is not budging on all these things. He's trying his best to convince the light. But, but the light is very steadfast in, in its teachings of, of what, what is real. You exist. Why do you keep bringing me here, you know? We do not bring you here, you bring us here. The, the mind that's caught up into linear time is like trying to, like a, like a black hole trying to suck everything and everyone into its crazy scheme of linear time. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> Why do we need new questions? Do we have enough questions already? <laughs> Why do we need new questions? I think maybe there's only one question of, that's even important, and that's, who am I? That's what Ramana Maharshi did. He just decided to devote his whole life to one question. Not new questions. Imagine going to Ramana Maharshi and saying, can I invent some new questions? And he just shakes his head. I'm not kidding this. You know, who am I is the one question that needs an answer, and the Holy Spirit's capable of delivering on that one. But we don't need new questions. This is turning into like a Jeopardy uh, show, you know, where you just have to keep, it's all more intellectual knowing, more questions, more answers. It's more defense against the truth. He's, now he's trying to bargain with light, he said, you and I, let's coexist. The humans, linear time, and eternity. Let's do some coexisting. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. God is not going to go, oh, wait, all right. All right. Been complaining for millions of years, all right. Like a parent does when you're a child, but they scream, and they throw a fit in the mall. I want the candy. They throw themselves on the floor. <laughs> they do a big fit to get the parent to cave in and give the candy. Look, I'll make a big scene in front of everybody and show, show what kind of parent you are to the whole mall. Unless you give me a candy, then I'll be hate if you give me a candy. You see, ego is trying to get God to say, all right, have your fantasy world. Go ahead, have your separation, death, sickness. Go ahead, all right. You've been holding out for millions of years. Okay, all right. I'll give you your death. You know, God is not going to cave in to this death wish. There is no way that they can coexist. That's almost like saying light and darkness, love and fear have to just coexist. And there are teachings that teach, yeah, you have to accept the good with the bad, and you know, you have to have to accept fear and love, but What's our, what's our song? You can relax now, why? Because there's only love. And that's what the light is doing. You see the light, just in the face, the light is not buying this whole thing. <laughs> that's the look of contentment. That's a Ramana look there. It's a look of contentment. It's not going to give in. Okay, let's see how this goes. <laughs> That's the one realization that you, that's the only realization you need for forgiveness.
It is not linear. Whatever you believe was the cause for how you feel, it's, it's a decision, it's a present decision. It doesn't have anything to do about past events. That's the trick of the ego, that the past somehow caused you to be the way that you are. But the past can't cause you, you have a creator. You have a creator who caused you. You have a creator who created you, not the past. Not the world, not the ego. So can I ask something? So this expression that you hear uh, people say many times, like, yeah, but everything you have gone through has brought you to this point now. Mm -hmm. How would you relate to that concerning this? Yeah, I've, I've addressed that one many times. That's, that's part of the lie too. Yeah. Everything that you've done has brought you to this point. Yeah. It's, it's, no, your mind is, is choosing at this point, in this moment, to perceive. In other words, the whole universe is holographic and what quantum physics is teaching, that there is no world apart from the world you think, everything that you experience is the result of a decision. If you keep playing the game of linear causes and consequences, which is what the ego invented, then you, you aren't happy. And if you just come to what, see how his face was shaking and he finally, he exhaled. Mm -hmm. It is not linear. And she said, it is not linear. The light confirmed, you got it. Like, that's the key to healing for all of us. Is retraining our minds to see that whatever, take responsibility, whatever we're feeling is what we're choosing to feel. Nobody's upsetting us, you know, that was all part of cause and consequence. You hurt my feelings. Remember when we were kids to our sister and brother? You hurt my feelings. You make me so mad. Yeah? Mm -hmm. External cause. Emotions are the cause of somebody else's behavior, somebody else's attitude, somebody else's action. The, the, imagine how that would revolutionize your relationships if you took back your power in your mind and you came to the power by realizing it is not linear. I am not going to, to, to buy <laughs> Siri. Siri doesn't like that. <laughs> you see, that's, there's Kayapaka looking. Now twice Kayapaka has said to him, Commander, Look for solutions from within. She's, she's the prophetess. He thought he was going to help her. <laughs> Twice now she said, Commander, look for solutions from within. That it just calling him to claim his power, to come back to that empowerment of mind and, and not be at the mercy of these, these memories. Because basically the light is just saying, you know, you exist in all the memories, because you exist everywhere, in everything. And ultimately our, our truth is even beyond perception, but we can't reach back to the truth until we are equally accepting of everything that's in our mind. We can't just push some away as bad and say, oh I want the good, but I don't want the bad. We have to start to see that that is our existence. We, we don't have the power to divide the world up into good and bad and right and wrong. We never were created with that power. Yes. What? And it gets to me all the time, but it gets to me all the time. It's this sentence, I choose to be here. He says it all the time, the, the commander, I choose to be here. So, and then of course, as my child, choose again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what I find so hard is, I don't really know what the other choice looks like. I, I have to believe that I would, you would show me heaven or love for just a nanosecond. So I'd say, oh yes, I want to choose that, you know, and, and jump into it and stay forever. But I 
don't have a clue what it looks like, so how can I choose it? Yeah, that, that's a very good description of the human condition. Mm -hmm. And there is a workbook lesson where Jesus says, of all the thoughts that you have in your mind, salvation is among them. Mm -hmm. And then he says a wonderful thing, he says, find it. <laughs> so it's like the old analogy of a needle in a haystack. You know, there's a golden needle. There's a golden needle in a giant stack of hay. We'll use a farm analogy. <laughs> there's a golden needle in the haystack. And Jesus is saying, find it. But, it's more than that. He's like saying, I found it. And I'll help you find it too. So it's not like we have to just throw hay <laughs> all over the place. But we have guidance that can take us in to that glorious alternative. He calls it the real alternative. There is a real alternative in the mind that doesn't lead to death. All the roadways of the world lead to death, but there is a real alternative in the mind that does not lead to death. He's saying, let's find it together. I'll, I have the light with me, and you come with me and I'll take you, and we'll find it together. From one who's already found it. That's important. So that's really what we're doing. And then here, this is his big pop, you know, he's popping right here, it's not linear. He's looking in Kayapaka's face, and now we're going to get taken back. Remember that scene on the surface with uh, Cisco and Captain Picard, where his face is like shaking with rage. Now he goes through this whole experience just so that he can come together and meet Picard in the moment, free of the past, free of that ang anger. And that's that's what's so important about it, what this is all really about. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, now we're really getting into it. You see, what, what's so great about this movie is it really cuts the chase, it really takes it down to what do I value, what am I going to use my mind's energy for, what am I going to pour my heart and soul into. Because once you start to understand the ego's tricks and ego's game, and it starts to be brought into awareness, why would you feed it? Why would you support it? So that's what the value of this movie, it starts to bring forgiveness into a new light. It starts to show how practical forgiveness is. How important forgiveness is. How worthy of your holy mind to devote to this. <coughs> and that's important too, because again, this world is distraction built. The ego has, it's very ingenious, it's got all kinds of tricks to try to lure the mind into these delay maneuvers and these distractions. But this really starts to point to how, how worthy we are how worthy we are of forgiveness. Okay, what was, any feelings come up with that, or reactions, <laughs> insights? I have to think of the movie of Walt Disney, Pinocchio. Pinocchio? Yeah, Pinocchio, when he goes to this uh, fantasy land and he obey his father, and he, at the end he uh, become a donkey, you know? Pleasure yeah. Island. Pleasure Island. I remember that. Yes. And at last, the forgiveness come and he become a real boy. Jiminy Cricket. Yes. He, remember how he, he wants to go off and be an autonomous, real boy? Yes. And he doesn't listen to, to Jiminy Cricket. Jiminy Cricket's there for his protection. His, his, his Holy Spirit. Yeah, His Holy Spirit, yeah. yeah. So eventually he has to listen to Jiminy Cricket. And the forgiveness 
from his own mind and forgiveness from his holy father. <laughs> and he become a real boy at the end. So we can take that analogy too because Pinocchio started off as a puppet. And a puppet who's on this marionette strings and in one sense it's the ego's attempt for us to be real boys and real girls and real men and real women. That's the problem. And we need to get back on the strings. We need to let the puppet <laughs> get back on the strings. We need to reverse Pinocchio and say, okay, Holy Spirit, uh, I'm back on your strings. You move the puppet. But the puppet doesn't have a life of its own. Actually, the desire for autonomy doesn't really get us anywhere. We were talking about that earlier, how most of us know we don't want to be dependent. We don't want to be dependent on parents, on the government, on anything of this world. We don't like how it feels to feel dependent. But it's the autonomous part that's so heavily reinforced. Hey, I got my own job. Great. Good. <laughs> the parents say, I've got my own career. I can, I can make my own decisions. I can pursue my time and space dream, a linear dream, and I can do it with gusto, and I've got the resources to do it. Well, the world would say, good, good, good. That's real good. But, but we have to go even beyond this goal of autonomy to come back to our true creation, which is spirit. And that takes one more step to, to trust, to let go of our past learning. What is learning in the world except it's, it's how to adapt and adjust to an insane world? And the more you learn, the more skills you have to adapt. That's why we go through education, we're, we're going through an adaptation process. And in the end, the Holy Spirit is saying, well, why don't you follow me? <laughs> because I can take you back to beyond this, this stream of duality to reality, as an alternative to just adapting and adjusting. I mean, most, what's the best that you can hope for with a child in the world is that the child will grow up to be a well-adjusted adult citizen who contributes to the gross national product <laughs> of the country. What, where, where is this going? We need, we, we need John Lennon's advice. Imagine there's no country. You know, we need that kind of advice because as long as we keep adapting and adjusting, we have to stop and pause and say, okay, and where is this heading? Well-adjusted human citizens? Okay. Is that going to bring us happiness and fulfillment? You know, we have to go in another direction. I saw a hand, yes. Like I said, Pinocchio wants to become a real boy, and we have to observe that, we have to become the puppet. And I get the feeling we always are a puppet. We are a puppet of the ego, we are a puppet of the family. We are always a puppet. We are always a puppet. Uh, Wait a minute, we have another one coming your way. You have something that's too important to say for the world to miss this. Hello. Ah. Uh, I've got the feeling that we always are a puppet, you know? We are a puppet for the, for the ego, or we are a puppet for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Only one, one, one thing gives me, gives me joy and, and, and hope, and the other one gives me sometimes a little bit love, but mostly shit. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how I feel. Yeah. So that's great. What you're, it's a great step to say, okay, we're puppets. Let's just quit pretending that these bodies are more than puppets. You know, let's admit that they're puppets. Who's pulling the strings yeah. of the puppet? Is it the Holy Spirit or the ego? It's, that's, that is very humble because right away, then, then you have a question like, okay, then it's important for me to tell the difference 
between this slippery, clever, sneaky ego and this loving, gracious, glorious presence called the Holy Spirit. I need to tell the difference because one or the other is pulling the strings. You might remember the Bob Dylan song, you're, you're going you're gonna to serve someone. You, it may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're going to serve, you're going to have to serve someone. Yeah, Bob, we can see, Bob, what's going on here. Am I serving the Lord, or am I serving the devil? That is the question. Shakespeare said, to be or not to be, that is the question. To be the Christ, or to be serving illusions, that is the question. That's really getting down to the, the core of it. And, and you can always feel it, you can feel it. It's which one you serve. When you really honest to yourself, you can feel what you serve. Yeah. That's it. Our feelings are our barometers, so that's our closest thing that we can use to tell the difference. When we're happy, gleeful, joyful, feeling free, we're serving the Lord. And when we're not feeling that way, then we're serving the, the sinister puff of nothing. <laughs> so we, you know, we have to, we have to discern. Yeah. But our will is also our Father's will, because we are one. Just when we are served our own will, then we are no puppies anymore. Yeah, yeah that's, that's where this is heading. Yeah, we, we go beyond the body to yeah. seeing that our will and God's will are one. Which is a great advance. I mean, a lot of Christians, I think even St. Francis, and a lot of the very sincere Christians have, have, have come to this, not my will, Lord, but thine. But you see there's still a separation. It's just a prayer to, to humble the ego and let thy will be known. But actually, it's even more humble to say, my will and thy will are one. We share the same, same will. That's really humble, to see that there's no difference. What God's will for me is what my true will is as well. So, what I get to is, okay, I choose to be here. The only reason I could, could for that could be... <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that, that microphone was delivered with some style. <laughs> Whatever's coming next must be very profound. <laughs> That's more exciting than the Olympics to me. <laughs> I drop my whole Hang on. Um, I choose to be here. That's what's, what was said and what keeps stick, sticking to me. So, the, in my thinking, the only reason I could choose to be here is because I believe I deserve punishment. I deserve to be unhappy. I deserve to suffer. Otherwise, I wouldn't want to be here. So, finding the, the needle in the haystack is finding the innocence to me. If that's so that's why the course is all about forgiveness. To to undo undo the guilt and, and just drop it, the belief in guilt. Because if I do that I would no longer choose to be here and punishment for myself. I can just let it all go. Yeah let's let's address that. I I choose to be here. So for me you know you've heard me say a number of times that to me that the spiritual awakening is 1% principle and 99% practice. So what I did, when I first got into the Course, I thought, wow, this is a big book. 31 chapters, 365 lessons, and a manual for teachers. It's a big book. I know in the English version it's over 1200 pages. 
But what I did was I asked Jesus, you know, to help zoom me in, focus me in. And in that first edition, the very first edition of the Course, on page 24, and in the subsequent editions, like third edition, and so on and so forth, on page 28, there's a prayer. And some of you know that prayer. I am here only to be truly helpful. So here you're saying, I choose to be here. Jesus is saying, good, good. Now here's a prayer for you who choose to be here. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent Him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, for He who sent me will direct me. I'm content to be wherever He wishes. Who oh, isn't that lovely? Wherever He wishes, knowing He goes there with me, and I will be healed as I let Him teach me to heal. Wow! Jesus takes that, I'm here, and He says, good, let's fan that into a prayer, and then here's your prayer. So what I did was, when I got that prayer, I said, oh, that's a good prayer. Ooh, that's a really good prayer. I'm glad you put that at the beginning of the book. I'm going to now practice that. And I told myself, let's practice that. Every time I go through a doorway, to go visit my grandmother, to go to the grocery store, to go to the laundromat, to go every time I pass through a threshold, I'm going to pause and silently orient my mind into the reason I am here. Because apparently, whatever I made a decision of before hasn't worked. Because I wasn't happy. I'm trusting that I'm going to take that prayer, I am here, to be only truly helpful. And I'm going to actually practice that. Before I go to my course group, as I go into the house, I'm going to say it. Before I go into the house, I'm going to say it. So I, I remember when I go down to that course group, and downstairs I'm going to remember it. When I'm going to the airport, when I'm doing, going to visit somebody, I want to always bring that back into awareness. And you know, I find that that helped me more than anything I could imagine, is my willingness to practice that, to like reorient. Because the ego has a whole, it's got a different reason to go to the grocery store. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. But when you go to the grocery store with the ego, there's an agenda there around the food, around what kind of food you buy, how much you pay, how much time you spend in there. Why would we care about getting in the shortest line if we didn't have an agenda to get the hell out of that grocery store? <laughs> there is an agenda to get in and out as fast as possible. And then we get a little miffed when we go in the 12 items or less lane we're, all, we're in the speedy lane now, we've carefully, we want 25 items, but we've just picked 12. Because why? Time pressure. We've got to get the hell out of there. So that's why we picked 12. We would rather have 20, but we took 12. And then we get in line and we look, and what's the person ahead of us got? We count them. 13. 13, can't you read the sign? It says 12. You see, your peace of mind is where? It's gone. When the person in front of you has 13 items. Can't you read? You see, the thing is, that's why we need that prayer, I am here only to be truly helpful. Because we have to reorient our mind to a new purpose. We're there as children of God, we're there as messengers of love and light. We shouldn't care about time. If we're there to teach only love in, in the grocery store. So then I started practicing with that prayer. Before I went into the grocery store, after I got the parking lot, before I go into the opening, the automatic opening doors, I, I pray the prayer. And then that changes our whole experience of the shopping at the grocery store. We smile at people. We make eye contact. We don't go zooming through with our head down on our cart. Like some kind of a race. You know, we're, the ego is putting a lot of time pressure on that shopping spree. 
And then, you know, it's then if you become health conscious, you have to read, to read the ingredients. And if you're economically conscious, you have to read how many ounces or grams or whatever, the cost per ounce, you know. There's the generic brand and then there's the name brand. You want to save money, you got to get the generic brands, but you want to make sure it has good ingredients. You don't want a bunch of fillers in there, so you spend your time reading. Instead of reading the course, you're reading <laughs> the nutrition facts. I ask you really, truly, is that a good use of time? The O percentage of cholesterol, percentage of saturated fats. Where is the causation? If your mind is being used by the Holy Spirit, you don't need to be worried about cholesterol and polyunsaturated fats, you know. It's your thoughts that mess you up. It's the thoughts that make you sick. And that's why you're there to go through the mind training with Jesus to let go of those cause-effect relationships. Ego says, well, just eat a lot of fatty foods that'll clog your arteries and clog your heart. And you'll have a heart attack and be dead. And then God will punish you. That's what it says, right? That's, what, that's how it talks, you know. And eventually you'll be punished, you know. You'll die and you'll get punished. You'll die faster if you eat fatty foods. But see, that's cause and effect. You see, it's a whole game. So I would suggest that you have that silent prayer and you, you move through the grocery store for one reason, for the holy encounter. When you meet someone, remember it is a holy encounter. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you will treat yourself. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. Never forget this, for in him you will find yourself or lose yourself. It's that important that we have that prayer in our heart. I am here, you said, to be truly helpful. Because I have to get my mind anchored in this new purpose. Because that new purpose is going to undo all of this false cause and effect learning. Everything you learn from science, everything you learn from, from books, much of what you learn from your parents, much of what you learn from watching television and everything, it's all part of false learning. And therefore false evidence appearing real is part of fear as well. So we need to come from that guided perspective. That, I found it very effective. It changed the way, I mean, my grocery trips went completely a different way when I prayed that prayer. And the same with the car wash, and the same with when you're in traffic and you're sitting at a red light. Or you're going down the street and you get a yellow light instead of gunning through the intersection at high speeds. I'm here only to be truly helpful. I could be just as helpful on this side of the light as that side of the light. I could be right helpful at the stopwatch. I had a funny crosswalks uh, scene come to me. I went down to Argentina and I was in downtown Buenos Aires. And uh, down there, a lot of times people don't pay attention to the traffic signals. The woman who picked me up from the airport, it was late at night, she was afraid because it was dark, and she ran 36 red lights on the way home. She went right through 36 red lights. I thought, okay. I'm here to be truly helpful, but traffic lights don't mean the same thing here in Argentina. That's that's okay, Jesus, I'm okay. So anyway, I went, I was downtown Buenos Aires and I was there and with all the tall buildings and I saw this guy come racing along. He was going very fast speed. And I was standing there and there was a little old lady who was moving like really slow. She was like going across the crosswalk like this. And I'm watching and she's going like this. And this car is coming so fast that it's coming right for her. 
at high speed. And then apparently the driver saw the old lady in the crosswalk and he's put the brakes on. So I'm watching the whole scene and he screeches and he screeches and screeches and screeches and screeches, you know, because he's going so fast and I'm just waiting to see if the car will stop before it hits the old lady. And the car screeched and screeched and smoke coming from the wheels and everything like this. And I'm just watching and the lady doesn't even look up. She's still like this. And the car comes. And the car comes within a foot. It stops like a foot short of her. And she finally she goes. Now now that's walking with grace. <laughs> she didn't even look up with all this screeching noise and everything like this. She, kept, she probably would have fell, but she kept on going and going and going and going. And then she was so slower. Again. But that's hilarious. But, you, but you, you have to develop that kind of modality where you're in your prayer and you're going with your in grace. You've got the whole universe with you. You're with the Spirit. You're with the Holy Spirit. All of time and space are being arranged just for your mind to teach the miracle, to extend love. Now that's how things turn around when you give yourself over to the Holy Spirit because everything you'll find is working for you and nothing is working against you. You have the experience that everything is always working for you. Many years ago, when my, my, when my son was uh, about 15 years, he uh, judoed in the national team of uh, the Holland, Netherlands. And he was uh, selected for the Youth Olympics place in Lisbon. And um, about um, two weeks before he left, he had an accident on the judo uh, mat. And the uh, three bands of his shoulder were uh, scurred, torn, tor and uh, the, the bones stand right on. And he had trust he even would go to the Olympic place. He went to a, a monastery and he buy a um, beer incense, yes. and he go to meditate on his room. And I was with him. And the third day, he was very still, and I think, oh, I must be still too. And um, after a period, he came, he was awake, and he said, I was out of my body. Not real, of course, but he was thinking he was out of his body. I said, I was so big, and my body was so small. Mm -hmm. And when I look, there was green energy streaming in my shoulder, and look! Use my shoulder, and he went to the Olympic place. Mm. Yes, yeah. it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. He had trust. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's the power of prayer. Yeah. He believed, yes. and, and prayer. Yeah. yeah, there are actually documented cases of of somebody who has not only had like a bone sticking out, but someone who has literally lost a limb. And it's almost, it seems like science fiction, but there's documented Christian science cases where through the power of prayer that entire limb that's been lost is regenerated. Because it's basically energy. It's just coming back from, from the energy and seemingly back into form and manifestation. So, so it, it goes far beyond the things that, that humans have believed, you know, the power of prayer. And of course Jesus, you know, with raising the, raising the dead, healing the sick, no order of difficulty in miracles. It's only the mind, of course, yeah. it's not real, and that's why we have Yeah, that's why with, if, God, if God is with you, who can be against you? There's, there is no awareness of against, that doesn't make any sense. I got to know about uh, Bruno Grüning, 
uh, Rio Cotillo, and there's groups all over the world, and she uh, basically teaches the people to just sit with legs apart, hands open, and ask for divine order, and just let God or grace pour, and there are amazing uh, documents written of healings, just teaching the people just to turn the grace. And I've been in a group myself, and I had also an amazing healing. <laughs> but then there was one thing, and it was the reason I went out of the group, that they invented, you could not embrace each other, because then it would not be nice for the people who had no one to embrace. And then I thought, no, that, that's not the way of uh, what I believe. And I think you would never thought of something like that. But yeah, Bruno Kuno was an amazing uh, healer. He, he never accepted money. He was a big friend of animals and, and very, actually a very simple person that just trusted God. And uh, just to, through this talking, people knew. And it's like what you said, it's the power that's there for us all the time. Bruno's, the end of yeah, Bruno's yeah, life was like yeah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I saw the movie uh, of Bruno Gronin and uh, the end of his life. Um, yeah, it was like Jesus. Not not crucifixion, but in, in a way, in a different form. But yeah. I was also in a meeting and I was so enthusiastic about this movie. I mean, this this guy is really, yeah, great. And I said, uh, yeah, I said it's just like Jesus, and everybody was like, run, run, run. I like I like this kind of story, and it's, it's it's beautiful, and that kind of that thing. We have to ask to, to heal their mind, you know, not the body. No, it, it's beautiful and we can help us some. But it's not our way. We have to cure the mind. Believe me. And you know that. Yeah, we, yeah. we talked about that before, that, that fragmented perception is the problem. So, if symptom removal seems to occur, so be it. If not, so be it. But, but the higher Healing is healing the mind, bringing the mind back to unified perception. So it's quite interesting that when people think of the life of Jesus and, and the many miracles and healings and everything, that can be given a great emphasis. But I always remind people, Jesus' mission was not to heal bodies. And, and believe me, there was a lot of healings that occurred around him, and still that wasn't his mission. He was to teach that our kingdom is not of this world. Our kingdom is not of linear time. And also, when you have symptoms re removed from bodies, then I always tell people, if you, if you just watch the earth and you watch the story, like even with Jesus, you know, the lame could walk, the blind could see, he cast out demons, healed the leopards, all the things, including raising the dead. But if you would have followed all those people, after all those things, the people still died. The people still got other diseases, and all that stuff about healing bodies was just part of a, a story. And so in the end, it's the teachings of Jesus go way beyond symptom removal, way, way, way beyond healing, because he was teaching, my kingdom is not of this world, that we have a heavenly kingdom, and we should be grateful for everything. Anybody who, who comes from suffering into a sense of, of comfort and blessing, that's, you know, we should give thanks to the Creator, give thanks to God for that. But it also kind of orients the things, uh, I always liked the idea that, that Jesus, you remember some of those scenes where um, the person would come up, either touch the hem of his garment or, or go through some kind of healing and he would say, by your faith, 
by your faith, you were healed. So he wasn't even going around like picking people out, okay, I'm going to heal you, 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 you today. Oh no, it was by your faith. And then, some of you remember from the Bible stories, when he went back to Nazareth, what does the Bible say when he went to Nazareth? There was no healings. Was it, Jesus had a bad day? Faculties weren't working there in Nazareth? No. In Nazareth, that's where, you know, Jesus was raised. And so the people simply didn't have the faith. They saw him showing up, he's got his robe on, his long hair, they go, what are you doing? He's like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Like, no you aren't. You're Joseph's son. I saw you grow up from a little boy, and uh, don't give me this Messiah stuff. I know who you are. You're just a human. Ordinary human, like the rest of everyone else. And there were no healings. Hmm, interesting. There was no faith. <laughs> because of why? Because of past associations. Thinking they knew who he was, based on his mom and dad and, and history. So again, it's just like the movie we watched, you know, it's, we have to have the faith that goes beyond the past associations, beyond the, the learning of the world. That's fascinating. I just want to say one thing that um, Bruno Grunin especially, it, it's, compares, it's comparable to Jesus because he all the time asks for your uh, thoughts to ask for divine order. That's actually all the time he talks about like a radio to dial your mind to God. So yeah. I just want to say yeah. that. Uh, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, now that's healing in the mind, bringing it back into order. Yes. Thank you. I want to touch your friend to your question about the choice we made and then we come to Jesus. We know in the course the, uh, the, uh, the way how to pray or the way to, to train our mind. Mind training. Uh, learning what love is by forgiveness and learning what oneness is by sameness and remembering God. And sometimes it's good to know what example we have. Not in the course. But I think the love of Jesus, well understood. His name was not Jesus, it was a, a curse name, but Romans, Jesus is probably Latin. He was a Jew. Um, Yeshua then. I think what I learned from him is what did he accomplish on the cross? Not the satis satisfaction of theory and theology, by his blood, you know, and he when instead of us, you know, having the punishment of God, none of that. What he did, I understood it. He did, or he accomplished total forgiveness of everyone, including his mother who came late uh, down to the cross, his wife, uh, Mary Magdalene, as we now know, and, and then all the others. He forgave them, all of one, one of them, after all his, you know, tribulations and all his pain and all his... Uh, uh, screaming of, of coldness and whatever. And I think in that stage he was in the real world. As we learn now from the, from, from the course, you are in the real world, people see you and you see the world, but you don't feel anything. At that moment I guess he didn't feel any pain anymore. He could take care of his mother, as a mother, he's your son, son is your mother, and to his uh, comrade he said, you will be with me. That I finished. I think that is an example which is very important and very comforting to me. So if you want to know how to decide, I think we can maybe visualize this example of, of, of Yeshua becoming to Christ on the cross. It is our way to. And the uh, course, the uh, comfort is we did not go to the cross like that. He did it for us. But this example, uh, his encouragement, what he did, what our example is, how, like Kenneth uh, Wapping said, how he stepped into his, his shoes and he become, we become Christ like him. I think that's a, a help for us to understand how to practice the cause in forgiveness. And that is, I think, a big, big difference with all the men who resemble in the life like Jesus, 
even Gilbert Browning. Of course, he is a very, very devout man. But this example, nobody brought, not even, not even Buddha. Hmm? Because Buddha stuck in his dualism of uh, awareness of, of, uh, of um, consciousness. Yeah? He didn't reach that hate of, of, of his Jeshua. And I think that he was already the voice of the cause. And that's, I think that's why I accept his authority in, in the cause. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think it's very important that, that as we wake up, you know, way showers like Jesus, the way, the truth, and life, that, that his, his behavior and also his attitude stand as, as just beautiful, shining examples of being able to reach that state of mind, accept oneself as the living Christ. And it helps to have symbols that you can relate to. And so, in that sense, I think the, the teachings, the words are important, the, the attitude. Imagine, imagine just being able to seemingly live your life, what seems to be your life in form, and have such kindness, such respect, such friendliness. Imagine being used to be so friendly to everyone and everything without exception. Just friendly. What a beautiful example that is for everyone. Just as a, almost like a bridge of saying, yeah, what I've done you shall do also, and greater things than me you shall do. So to me, that's, that's why it's so practical. I was talking the other day about holy relationship too. We, we talked about holy relationship and it's a, it's a phenomenal teaching learning accomplishment. Does it, it still involve bodies? Yes, it does. The holy relationship is still in the realm of bodies, but the example is one of, of kindness, of respect, of of equality, of friendliness. You know, it's, it's imagine that the bodies could be used in a way as a demonstration that it's actually possible to transcend the ego. And it's still tangible, still, it still involves bodies. The holy instant will, in Revelation, go beyond the realm of perception, but but again, Jesus is so good, he's saying, this is a course in miracles. He doesn't call his book a course in revelation. He doesn't call his book a course in light. <laughs> he doesn't call his book a course in love. He calls it a course in miracles. Why would he use miracles? Because they're the most practical thing that we have available to expand our consciousness to what you're talking about, to that high, high state of mind. And so, I do feel like, in my life, uh, I think role models and mentors, uh, including Jesus, have been, and especially Jesus, I could say, have been very, very helpful. Because it's, it's not just trying to dismiss the world, it's, it's saying, let the world, let all the symbols be used for the glory of God. And Jesus was always pointing at God. He never wavered in that. And also he tells us he's just, he's like our brother, you know. He said, awe should be reserved for God. Don't hold me in awe, he said. Just leave the awe for God. <laughs> we have a great creator. So to me that's, that's really beautiful. So thank you for sharing that, because I think that's, yeah, that's a practical world. I know a lot of us just live our lives and, and that's who we talk to. I did a conference uh, recently, I was in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains, up at the Rocky Mountains, and somebody asked me the question, they said, they said, uh, David, who is your teacher? I said, Jesus. Yeah, without a question. It's just a, a sense of a presence and 
Yeah, I think it's, you know, we're, there's a sense of almost like uh, great gratitude or adoration that's even there. And thankfulness, like thank you. <laughs> thank you for your decision for resurrection and thank you for your example. Uh, I would like to make a suggestion. For... You've got a microphone here. For the, the program for this evening, uh, I get the feeling this would be a rather nice point to just end today's session. It's been a rather intense uh, day. And we need some integration time. It was a pretty intense movie as well. Is there anybody who would say no, 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 no? Want to continue to do? No, I feel it. I feel it. It's been a very, I can feel it. It's been a very intense day. Yes, it has. For my legs, pumping a bicycle, it's been a very <laughs> intense day. I don't think I've pumped a bicycle like that for, since last year in Sweden. <laughs> so, so, is it, is it okay to That feels good. And then, and tomorrow we should say that uh, 5 o'clock is our... No, not in the morning. 5 p.m. is our closing. So I understand that you can get the announcements. It's like 10, is it 10.30 that we start? Yeah, I have a few more. Okay. That will, that will give us a little snapshot. Hey, yeah. Um, before we can close all of this, can I, can I have a quick question? Yes, and of course. Of course. Yeah. 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 Without the body. Can I have the microphone? Without the body. I just want to wrap up like, like the movie and the teaching. And uh, just to re repeat it in a nutshell, maybe, so I, I got it. Like this time thing and grievances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the point is like sin, guilt, grievances need like this time illusion to, to make everything work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is if I like, if I'm stuck in this time illusion, I can let all the darkness like come up hand it over, and this way it, I don't know, and that stops all the illusion already? Mm -hmm. or, like the, the, the forgiveness that mm -hmm. takes place, like collapses time already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like linear time, it's like we could put cause comes first, right? And effect comes second. In physics, where we actually there's a reaction. In li linear time, cause comes first, but that comes second. Well, the miracle collapses time. It's almost like if you had, if all of time was represented by a stick of celery, mm -hmm. and you get your chopping knife out. You go chop, 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 chop. And the celery stick gets shorter and shorter. What's happening is, is cause and effect are being brought together. The spaghetti. The spaghetti. Or, uh, yeah, it's, it's just collapsing, 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 so that in the end, what, you, what did Jesus tell us? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. See, he's just telling us it's all the same. It's all the same in the present moment. There's no separate causes and effects. So we don't have to believe that certain things cause certain illnesses, certain things cause better health, you know, those are all conditionings of false cause-effect relationships of just these concepts, crazy concepts. So that's exactly what's happening. It's bringing cause and effect together. Now what does that mean, ultimately, is that in heaven, cause and effect are together. And when Jesus taught, I and the Father are one, he was te simply teaching that cause Father and I, the effect, are Christ, are one. So in heaven, cause and effect are together. And if we want to experience heaven on earth, so to speak, all we need to do is allow that collapse to occur. So we see, you know, all the things, 
and it happened before, as Marianne said, it didn't bring us to the present moment. And this is like when all, all the splinters come together and you just see the oneness. Yeah, it all merges, it all merges together. Wow, that's a great idea to go to sleep with tonight. <laughs> Thank you. That's beautiful. It's finished. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is finished. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.